I'm so glad to be with you this morning. Uh, if you're new with us this morning, I want to again uh, repeat what Pastor Nathan said. Say welcome. Thank you so much for choosing to join us here at First Wesleyan Church. Uh, my name is Jeremy Little. I'm the growth groups pastor here at First Wesleyan Church. And I am excited to be here and excited to bring the word with you this morning. And so if you would go ahead and turn into Mark, the book of Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be there this morning. I also want to say welcome to anyone joining us online. Thank you so much for watching with us, whether you're watching live with us right now or later on throughout the week. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us. And we're glad that you're here. So last week we started a new series called Marked for Action. And Pastor Joe brought us uh, kind of the, uh, the opening, the introduction, talking about that we are going to spend the next several weeks uh, going through the book of Mark. And so we're going to be studying the book of Mark. And what Mark has to say is he tells us the story of Jesus Christ when he walked on the earth. This is the second book in the New Testament. And uh, a variety of biblical scholars say that Mark was a simple storyteller. And I think that's part of why I like the book of Mark is because uh, personally I, I, love, I love simplicity. There's no reason to make the gospel complicated. There's no reason to make the story of Jesus complicated. Jesus came and he spent his time on the earth teaching the good news and he died on the cross so that we can be saved and go to heaven and we can spend eternity with him and we can serve him while we're here on earth. And so Mark is a simple storyteller. He wants the listeners to learn the story of Jesus and become a person who practices Christ-like actions. And so that's what we're here over the next several weeks. We're here to listen to the story of Mark, to see how Jesus acted, to see the things that he did while he was here on earth, and so that we can live like him. Today we're going to look at the first 20 verses in the first chapter of the book of Mark. And when Mark wrote the first 20 verses, he offered five distinct sections of information. Five distinct sections of information that we're going to look at today. And they would be primarily considered descriptive rather than prescriptive in their nature. So they're kind of describing what's going on. And the first section is very short. It's literally just the first verse. And it's a simple introduction. He tells his readers that this is a gospel about Jesus Christ. It's the good news story about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And in, in this time period, you know, I, Pastor Joe talked about last week how the emperor, the Roman emperor, considered himself to be a god. And so for Mark to say that this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would be in contrast to what the Romans would have them believe at the time. And so... It, rather than the Roman emperor being God, Jesus Christ was the son of God. There is a one true God, and he's not the Roman emperor. The second section of this chapter, he immediately talks about John the Baptist and says, John the Baptist was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. We've known about John the Baptist coming for years. In fact, the book of Isaiah would have been written about 700 years before John the Baptist and Jesus were born. And so many, many years before, we knew that someone was coming who was going to prepare the way for the Messiah. He was coming to tell the people, repent, because the Messiah is coming. John's message was to call people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. The third section describes Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist and then going into the desert to face temptation. And we're going to talk about that here in a little more detail. And the fifth section mentions Jesus inviting four men to become disciples and inviting them to give their whole life to follow Jesus. So that's just a brief overview of the five sections that we're going to see as we read or listen to or watch the first 20 verses of the book of Mark. If you were here last week, you saw Pastor Joe intro the Lumo Project's uh, presentation of the book of Mark. And so you're going to see some visual illustration of what it might have looked like in that time, but you're going to hear the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, word for word, read over what it might have looked like in the story that Mark is describing. So let's watch this.
beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me, comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, my love. With you, I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishing. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. I don't know about you, but when I read, whether it be the Bible or anything, my, my imagination kind of goes into overtime trying to figure out what it would have looked like and imagining, picturing what's going on in whatever I'm reading. And so for me, the Lumo project, I, I just think it's really cool because I, I can, you can see what it might have looked like. You can see what the situation might have looked like, what the interactions might have looked like. And I just think it's really cool. And I don't, if any of you followed along in your Bible while they were reading, I mean, they're just simply reading the Bible over, the, over what it might have looked like. And so it's, I think it's really cool. I'm really, and we're going to continue to use this as we work through the book of Mark uh, over the next few weeks. So here's, let, let's just get some groundwork laid, okay? We're going to ask the question first, how are we going to study these passages? As we read through the book of Mark, we're going to get through the entire book of Mark, and we're going to study section by section, how are we going to study the passage? Well, we're going to ask a few questions. First, we're going to say, what did the author say to the readers 
then and there. So what did it mean to the people of Israel there in that time, whoever was reading this, this letter from the book from Mark? Uh, second, was it descriptive? Is it simply describing a story? As we kind of already talked about, today's passage is simply describing a few things. They're describing uh, John the Baptist preaching in the desert. They're describing Jesus being baptized. They're describing him calling the first few disciples. So was it descriptive or was it prescriptive? And so today's is a little bit more descriptive. And the last question we ask is, what is Mark saying to us here and now? So what was he saying to them, but what is he saying to us here and now? What can we take away from this passage as we read, as we study? So there's a few lessons, and uh, if, you, if you look at your bulletin this morning, you see 10 blanks there, 10 points. Um, I just want you to know that we're going to be here until about 1 o'clock. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're going to camp on a couple of them, but we're going to go through all 10 of these. Um, and I want you to see what are the lessons we can learn for the here and now in the first 20 verses of the book of Mark. And so the first verse is simply, the message of Jesus Christ is a wonderful message of good news in a bad news world. Be willing to share it. Mark simply says, I'm here to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel about Jesus Christ the Son of God. And so we need, we need to take this message and share it as, as well because our world needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. This is a good news letter, and you can ask yourself this question as you're reading this passage. Am I willing to share this news as well? Mark was willing to write a letter. The disciples were willing to tell about the good news. Today, here and now, are we willing to share the good news with the people around us? Are we willing to do what Mark did? We might ask the people around us, has anyone ever told you the good news of Jesus Christ? And if they don't know the story of Jesus, then that's your opportunity to share that good news with them. But we need to be willing to share it. The second thing is we need to live a humble life before God. And remember that life isn't about me, but it's about making Jesus famous. Look at John the Baptist. Especially if you look at verse 6, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his, his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I just want to tell you that camel hair was not like a high fashion trend of the ancient time here, okay? John was not, you know, they, they didn't sell that at the high-end mall. Uh, the camel hair was probably something that he had to make himself. It was kind of a low end, like, oh man, I can't find anything else, but at least this covers me kind of deal. And he simply had the leather belt to tie it together so it wouldn't fly off. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And probably that's just what he could find. Okay? We're not, he's, this isn't the high end food district here, locusts and wild honey. John was not out to proclaim himself. He wasn't standing out there saying, look at me, look at me, look how I dress, look at the great stuff I get to do, come be like me. Can you imagine somebody dressed and eating like John, who is just scraping by, and, you know, I, that's not exactly who we're trying, you know, we don't exactly want that same lifestyle, right? Like in today's world, today's world does not say, let's go barely scrape by, let's find whatever clothes we can peel off of a dead animal and, uh, and, and wear that, but... John was not out to bring attention to himself. In fact, John's message was, repent and be baptized because someone greater than me is coming. Repent and be baptized because this next guy is so amazing that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Repent and be baptized because the Messiah is coming. Life is not about us. In your life, it's not about making you famous. It's not about getting people to look at you and say, oh man, look at the great things they're doing. Look at the way they dress. Look at the life they get to lead. That's not what it's about, but it's about us pointing to Jesus through the way we live our lives. I'll tell you that um, most of you know that, that most Sundays I get to lead worship in this service, and it's real easy to stand up here and lead worship and try to make it about yourself. Look at me, I get to stand up here and play songs and sing and everybody's looking at me. 
And it would be real easy to stand up there and try to draw all the attention to yourself. Look at this awesome guitar solo I can do, which I actually can't do. But um, look at these great, I could sing this really high note, or I can sing this great song that everybody knows. It would be real easy to stand up there and draw the attention to ourselves. And something that I pray every week, and I talk to the worship team about every week, is that we're not up there to draw attention to ourselves. But we're drawing attention to God. And I pray every week, God, I just pray that the music that we sing draws attention to you. And I hope that it does. And I hope that you come to church not to stare at the people that are on the stage, but to stare at an almighty God and worship him and give your attention to him. Because life is not about drawing attention to us. And Mark shows us through the story of John that it's about drawing attention to the one that was coming after, to the Messiah, to the Savior of the world. Live a humble life before God. Number three is that Jesus will baptize or fill us with the Holy Spirit. And we need to surrender to Jesus for that infilling. Verse 8 said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word baptized in this passage simply means to wash or overwhelm. So Jesus is coming to wash or overwhelm us with the Holy Spirit replacing our old sinful nature with a new nature of the Holy Spirit. So you need to ask yourselves this morning, am I allowing the Holy Spirit to wash over me? Am I allowing the Holy Spirit to cleanse me and make me new? See, we need to surrender to the Holy Spirit. John said that Jesus is coming and he, ha- he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, but he will only baptize us with the Holy Spirit if we surrender to him. I believe that John was surrendered to him. He gave, tried to give all the attention to Jesus. Jesus clearly was surrendered to God and his will. And the Holy Spirit only comes on us if we surrender. And you may ask yourself, well, how do I know if I'm surrendered to the Holy Spirit Paul, actually, later in the book of Galatians, gave us some things that can show us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. That's in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And so if you are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, and if you are allowing the Holy Spirit to wash over your life and to cleanse you, those are the things that other people should be able to see in your life. The love, the joy, the peace, and all those things. So you can ask yourself and do a self-evaluation. Am I surrendered to the Holy Spirit? Are these fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5 part of my life? Can I see them in my own life? You may ask a trusted friend or accountability partner, can you see these things in my life? Am I surrendered to the Holy Spirit? Number four, there's a beautiful example of God the Father commending the Son and expressing his pleasure toward his Son. Verse 11 says, and a voice came from heaven, you are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. I think this is a great example for fathers today to pattern yourselves after this one simple statement. And you might say, well, you know, I tell him all the time that I love him, or I I don't need to, I don't need to, uh, to, to tell him these things. I don't need to, to say these exact words, commending my son. Uh, But God did it with His son. So think about this: if there was ever a person who had absolute certainty that his father loved him and was proud of him, it was Jesus, right? Who else could have the same certainty that their father loved them and was proud of them like Jesus did? He was absolutely certain. There was no question. But God still said that this is my son whom I love and I am pleased with him. So fathers, I would challenge us to do the same thing. Are you commending your children Are you praising them, not for the accomplishments that they do, not for the fantastic grades, not for the great sports accomplishments, but are you commending them simply for who they are? 
Do they have a, do they have a, a passion? Do they have a love like Christ? Do they have a tender heart? Are you commending them for simply who they are? The word pleased in this verse is the idea of thinking well of or taking pleasure in. Parents, are you taking the time to think well of and take pleasure in your children and to commend your children? Are you taking the time to encourage them through the reading of God's word and commending them for who they are? Do you value them just for who they are as a person, not for what they do? I encourage you to look at the example of God and follow. Next, we realize that Jesus was tempted by Satan so he can understand when we are tempted. You may have heard it said that Jesus understood, understands any temptation that we go through. And we see right here at the top of the book of Mark that the Spirit sent him out into the desert in verse 12. And he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. So we realize that temptations are, Satan is behind the temptations in our own lives. So what tempts you? In this case, Jesus was fasting for 40 days. And we read uh, in other parts that Jesus was tempted. Satan tempted him to turn rocks into bread so he could eat. Satan tempted him with power. Satan tempted him with fame. How many times in our world, in our lives today, are we tempted with power or fame or eating things that we shouldn't eat? Maybe we're tempted with lust. Maybe we're tempted to lie. Maybe we're tempted with pride. Whatever it is in your life, what are you tempted by? What in this world grabs your attention and you say, oh man, I could do that. It'd be easy for me to fall into that. Man, that looks really good. It'd be so easy to just tell this little lie so that I don't get in trouble. It'd be so much easier to eat whatever this is that's convenient, even though it's terrible for you, instead of whatever is right and healthy. And it's easy to take on some pride of, yeah, I did that, when really God is working through you. What is it that you're tempted by? And number six follows along with that. We see angels attended to Jesus when he, was attempt, when he was tempted. And so when you're tempted, call on God. Call on God for power. Call on God for strength. Call on God for the willpower to make it through. And when you're tempted, run away from that temptation. You saw the little video uh, of Dave Ramsey, and he gets pretty excited about financial peace when he's speaking, uh, but he talks about running away from the debt, running away from the temptation to make your debt bigger, to make things worse, running away. And I think that we need to be the same way about any temptation in your life. When you're tempted to do something that you know is sin, when Satan creeps into your mind and says, it's okay, run away. Leave the room, leave the place, close the computer, put the phone away, whatever it is, close the fridge. I don't know, whatever it is that's tempting you, get away from it. Ask God for willpower, ask God for strength. The angels attended to Jesus after he had been tempted, and it's very possible and even probable that angels can attend to us as well when we're tempted. And when we're tempted, we have to ask, we have to give. Again, surrender to the Holy Spirit. Surrender in those moments and ask for strength in the temptation. In this passage, the word attended, there's a Greek word called diakoneo, and it's the root word for deacon. And deacon is one who serves or waits upon another. And from this passage, we learn that angels helped Jesus in his time of temptation, I believe that angels can help us and be a servant to us in our time of need as well. And I believe we ought to seek and expect that service when we're in temptation, when we're being tempted. We should seek and expect that help and that wisdom and that strength. The next thing, number seven, Following Jesus means we participate in the fishing for men business. We participate in the fishing for men business. 
Jesus said, come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I realize when we're reading this, it's a specific statement to these two fishermen, but this statement applies to all of us. Because we read later in Matthew chapter 28 and in Mark chapter 16 that Jesus said we are called to go and make disciples. That we're all called to be fishers of men. We know this because of these passages. So we're all called to be fishers of men. And I believe that that's part of who we are as Christians. That we're called to go and tell the good news like we talked about back at number one. We're called to tell the good news. So this is interesting. I, may, I would ask you the question, are you prepared to fish for men? Are you prepared to share the gospel? If the opportunity came up for you to tell someone about the good news of Jesus Christ, do you know what you would say? Are you prepared to share the gospel and fish for men? There's an interesting study uh, by Barna, and it's actually really recent. It was just re- released this year, 2019. Um, and it says, the, the title of it was, Millennials are ready, but not willing to talk about their faith. So let me give you a couple of stats. This is just interesting stuff, talking about sharing our faith. Almost all practicing Christians, according to the study, believe that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. We're talking 95 to 97% of believers surveyed said that part of our faith means telling people about Jesus. And that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to know Jesus. 94 to 97% of those surveyed said that's the best thing that could happen to someone. Millennials in particular feel equipped to share their faith, so they feel ready to share their faith. For instance, almost three quarters of them say they know how to respond if someone raises the question about what they believe. 73% of them said they know how to respond. And 73% also said that they are gifted at sharing their faith with other people. And this is actually higher than any other generation surveyed. Gen X, only 66% of people said they were ready. Boomers, 59%, and elders, 56%. So millennials were the highest percentage that said they were ready to share their faith. They know what to do. Despite this, millennials, many millennials, are unsure about the actual practice of evangelism, meaning that almost half of them, 47%, agreed, at least somewhat, that it's wrong to share one's personal belief with someone of a different faith. Did you catch that? These are millennial Christians that say they know how to respond, but almost half of them say that they think it's wrong to share their faith with someone of another faith. That kind of blew my mind. Like, why? You know how to do it, but you think you shouldn't? The same question, uh, do you think it's wrong to share your faith with someone of another faith? Only 27% of Gen X, 19% of boomers, 20% of elders felt the same way. Jesus wants us to be fishers of men. He called us to go and make disciples. And I'm here to tell you that it's not wrong to share your faith with anybody. Jesus called us to share our faith with everybody. To, to Judea, to Jerusalem, Judea, to the Samaria, to the ends of the world. Meaning we share it with people around us. We can go out to other places, to any part of the world. Jesus said, let's go and share the good news. So I don't know why. I don't know what. Uh, the people that are surveyed, what happened, what they were taught, what they were told, what has caused them to believe that it's wrong to share their faith with people of other faiths. But I believe that's what we're supposed to do. That's what Mark said when he, when, or that's what Jesus said when he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And later when he said, go and make disciples, he wasn't just talking about people that don't believe in anything or people that are kind of half Christian and, and they're not sure, but everybody. We're called to go and make disciples of everybody. Jesus called his followers to be fishers of men. And I believe for us that may, that's in our home, that's in our neighborhood, that's with our coworkers, that's in our community, that's anyone we come in contact with, no matter what they believe. 
It's our responsibility to make sure they know the good news about Jesus. So I think every day we need to ask ourselves, am I intentionally conducting my life in a way that will help lead people to come to know and follow Jesus? It's a big question. I want to say it again because I think we need to ask this question and I think you need to write it down. If you struggle with sharing your faith, if you think, oh, I don't know, it's right there in the Bible. Jesus said, let's go make fishers of men, let's go make disciples. So ask yourself this question. I'm going to read it again. Am I intentionally conducting my life in a way that will help lead people to come to know and follow Jesus? Am I intentionally conducting my life in a way that will help lead people to come to know and follow Jesus? A simpler way might be just to say, how can I fish for men today? But be intentional about it. If you are in a small group, or maybe you have an accountability partner, and you guys have decided, okay, yeah, we want to be more intentional. Let's hold each other accountable to making disciples. You can ask this question. How's your fishing going today? Did you catch anything? But I first challenge you to ask yourself, how am I doing? What am I doing to fish for men? Number eight. Common, ordinary people can be involved in disciple making. Common, ordinary people can be involved in disciple making. We've talked about this before. I can remember a couple of years ago where we preached through uh, each disciple one at a time and talked about who they were and their background and where they came from and why they were qualified to be Jesus' disciples. Guess what? They weren't. They were simple, ordinary men. I mean, we just read right here that Jesus called four fishermen. What? What about fishing qualifies you to be a disciple of Christ? I'm not sure, except that he related it to fishing for men. Uh, But I don't think they're literally casting out nets to catch people and bring them to Jesus. Uh, They might have been. I don't know. That's an interesting strategy. But Jesus asked common fishermen to to follow him and learn how to help others come to know and follow Jesus. Jesus uses common people to do his work. I think the lesson here is that Jesus called common fishermen to be his disciples. Very often we hear people say, I'm not important. I don't have the skills. I didn't go to Bible training. I didn't do this. I don't have this. I don't know this. See, the thing is, and I know we've said this before, but I think we need to continue to hear it, that Jesus doesn't wait till you're qualified to call you to serve him. Lots of times, Jesus will call us to do something that we don't feel prepared for, but he gives us the gifts and the talents to do it. So it doesn't matter if you feel prepared. What we need to do is surrender to the Holy Spirit. Going back to the beginning, we need to surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit. Say, Jesus, if you've called me, to do this, whatever it is. I mean, look through, we even listed some areas that you could start serving today and whether you feel called to it or not. There's some things in the bulletin that are areas that you can serve. And you can say, Jesus, if you're calling me to go serve in Awana or on the bus ministry or in the parking lot and you don't think, I, and you think, I don't know what to do with any of those, but God, I want to do it and I trust that you'll give me the skills, the talent, the passion to do it. I think that's where we need to be at. We need to be willing to serve and trust God to give us the skills to do it. Because Jesus doesn't call the prepared. He calls the willing. He calls those that are surrendered to him. It's common for Jesus to reach out to the ordinary and invite them to be a disciple. Common, ordinary people can be involved in disciple making. See, this this is, I think, even in discipling other Christians. Because, I mean, we we offer, I mean, we have services on Sunday. We have, uh, 
uh, age-appropriate ministries throughout the week. We have growth groups uh, most nights of the week and Sunday mornings. And this is all discipleship in one way or another. But I believe that we're all called to disciple others. I think we're all qualified to walk someone through the Bible and the Holy Spirit will guide us on how that applies to our lives. I think if you feel called to discipleship, then, then if there's someone that, you're, that you know that needs to be discipled, then just read through the Bible together. Ask them, how, how does this apply to your life? What is God telling you through these verses? And if you still think, well, I, I need... I need some kind of plan. I need some kind of, I'm not sure where to start. I'm not sure what questions to ask. Come talk to me. I've got some stuff for you. Okay? Because I believe that we're all called to be disciples. I believe that we're all called to walk people through growing in their relationships with God. And I think if we're willing and surrendered to God, then we're all qualified to do it. So I, I think that we all need to be walking someone through their relationship with Christ and helping them grow and understand the Bible. And I think we all can. Because Jesus only called the common, ordinary people. He didn't wait till they were ready. He called them and they were willing to go. And it said they went immediately. I wrote down in my Bible when I was reading that, they did not hesitate. Jesus called the first two, and they dropped their nets, and they followed him. Jesus called the second two, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And I think, I mean, it's just a couple of sentences, but they were clearly in a successful fishing business. James and John worked with their father and their hired men. I think they're doing pretty good if they're hiring other people to fish with them. Because, um, I, you know, if you read about that time period, most of the time it's probably just a family business fishing out on the water. It's just a couple of guys fishing and hoping to sell enough to make money and using what they caught too to feed their family. But the, James and John left their dad and the hired men to go. Fo- so they left a successful business that they were probably going to inherit to go follow Jesus. So we just have to be willing We just have to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And that's actually number nine. Uh, We get into that. Maybe I got ahead of myself. But number nine says, Simon and Andrew demonstrated immediate action in following Jesus. This is a great example of how we should respond to Jesus. The English Standard Version in verse 18 says, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus is calling all of us to follow him. Whether it simply be to, to serve him and, and obey him in your daily life. Some of us he calls to be uh, uh, pastors and missionaries and serve him full time and not work in, in, in some other job. But he calls all of us to follow him. He calls all of us to serve him. So what's your response? Are you hesitating? Why? What are you waiting for? Because if Jesus called, that's the biggest open door you need. If you know that Jesus wants you to serve him in some specific way, you don't need any other signs. Just be obedient. Be willing to go. Take the step. I could tell you several stories about God calling our family to move here or go do this and fighting and arguing and finally just relenting and the blessing that that ended up being. Uh, It's not worth fighting and arguing. When God tells you to do something, just go. Just surrender. Say, God, I don't know why. I don't understand this. But you're telling me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And I believe that you'll give me what I need to make it happen. And he does. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Respond immediately, not with hesitation. Finally, we're at number 10. James and John, and I guess I really did get ahead of myself, but James and John gave up a successful business to follow Jesus. Are you willing to follow Jesus at any cost? Maybe you have a successful business and God's telling you to give it up to do something else for him. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to walk away from security? I mean... 
the world's security anyways? Are you willing to walk away from certainty when it comes to uh, finances or your day-to-day routine? Are you willing to walk away from quote-unquote security and comfort and routine for what God may be calling you to do? Now, maybe God's calling you into a place where that, you get all that stuff. I'm not saying that he calls all of us to step away from success or security, but if he does, are you willing to go? That's the thing. Where is your heart? Are you willing to go? Would you say, God, this doesn't make sense from the world's standards, but you're calling me to do it and I'll go and I trust you. Where's your heart in that scenario? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to surrender? Are you willing to follow Jesus at any cost? Jesus calls us to follow him. Jesus calls us in that following to tell people about him. To help people know him through discipleship. So I want you to ask yourself this question. This is our take home lesson. This is our action because the title of the series is marked for action. So we're going to get some action out of each and every one of these messages. Some things that we need to do. So ask yourself this question. What is the Spirit of God speaking to me, asking me to do or stop or change? What is the Spirit of God speaking to me, asking me to do or to stop or to change? God's called us all to follow Him, to tell people about Him, to disciple others. And how does that look in your life right now? What is God calling you to do And I challenge you to stop waiting, stop hesitating, surrender, give it to God. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you inspired Mark to write down your story, to write down the story of Jesus and all that he did and said while he was walking here on earth. And I thank you for the lessons that we see. Lord, I just, I ask that you speak to each and every one of us right now. Lord, you're calling us all to serve you in different ways, in different circumstances. Lord, help us to be willing to follow you no matter what. Help us to be willing to give up what we have to follow you if that's what you're telling us to do. Help us to evaluate our lives. Lord, Holy Spirit, come into each one of us today and help us to evaluate our own hearts. Where am I at? Am I surrendering my life to you or am I following my own ideas? Lord, give us that insight and help us to make change when it's necessary. To follow you with our whole hearts. Thank you so much for your word. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope you're staying for lunch. Um, You can see on the screen, next week we'll be in Mark chapter 1, 21 through 45. So I encourage you to read that this week. Read it with your family. Have a great day and a great week. God bless.